We, on the other hand, promote and support the dual preparation for war and revolution under the auspices of a more intense patriotism in the divine name of Italy blazoned across our skies in the fiery vapors of a revitalized Italian courage. We believe that only an aesthetic of blood and an ethic of danger and heroism can purify and regenerate our nation. Salwete legionaries, I am joined by uh, one of my favorite recurring guests, uh, General Lance from Lance's Legion and Honored Legate of New Rome. Today we're going to be speaking about a very, very interesting and flamboyant and man of austere aesthetic Marinetti, the uh, nominal leader of the Italian futurist, a very interesting ideological and artistic movement that I think we have found a lot of inspiration from, and I know certainly Lance has. So without further ado, Lance, uh, would you care to introduce Marinetti to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much for having me again. And Salway Legionaries, of course, as always. Uh, but I think the most important thing, uh, just to give you before even a feedback, I'd kind of want to transport your mind, your soul back to the time when Filippo Marinetti uh, was coming of age. And this was during the time of the Great Powers, right? The Great Powers was a time when Effectively, the end of history had happened in, our, in their own way, where it's it was kind of a stifling uh, environment in which the various great powers, which at the time were, of course, uh, the United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, and uh, the German Empire as well, um, basically were in, in, in equilibrium. And uh, they were roughly in a hegemonic balance throughout the world. They had vast colonial empires. In fact, uh, Filippo Marinetti was born and raised in the Suez Canal. His father had been a an engineer who was part of the firm, right? So the firm would be like the canal itself would contract a number of different individuals uh, who would be part of that firm, right? And that firm would uh, maintain the locks and, and the thoroughfare and, and guide the different uh, uh, ships through the canals. And as you know, the Suez Canal is one of those kind of great innovations, technological innovations, which uh, shaped the course of U.S. history or, excuse me, world history. Same thing. Right. But uh, what I would like to say is, is uh, I mean, think before the Suez Canal, before the Suez Canal had been invented or created, um, it would you'd have to go beyond the Cape of Good Hope, which is all the way in South Africa, turn around the. Uh, Cape, and it was an extremely hazardous journey. Even today, it's extremely, um, you know, prejudicial to ship integrity. It's very difficult. It keeps, you know, your crew up, but also um, there's riptides and all kinds of crazy shoals, like rocks under the waters. And many, many a sailor has uh, died uh, trying to cross those, um, you know, that, that strait. And so the Suez Canal allowed for traffic, international traffic from India in a, and around the Saudi Arabian Peninsula to traffic all the way through the Suez, right? And uh, the Suez, for those of you who don't know, it's in Egypt, right? It's basically between the Sinai and the mainland. Now, I'm assuming my personal experience is that, uh, you know, Marinetti, having come from an engineering family and, and kind of fallen in love with what technology could do and shake up the old world and kind of uh, discard all the old, you know, boring sclerotic uh hindrances that face mankind and conquer nature as well as conquer other human beings right so it's basically an, a spirit of conquest and from a young age he juxtaposed the innovation of the suez with first of all you know obviously the mamluks and the uh basically the Cadivate of Egypt, which was under British control, and how backwards most of the Bedouin and the locals were, and to say nothing, of course, of the larger society as a whole, Victorian era, you know, uh, Egypt was kind of this sclerotic, slow, lethargic um, social environment where um, you know, people are very prudish and slow. I can't even explain to you. If you were basically raised in the 90s and the early 2000s, you would know what I'm talking about. It's basically uh, office space writ large, right? And so for him, his great vision was to shake up 
the world? And what's the best way to shake up the world, if not through art? Because everything always emulates, emanates from the spirit, the soul, which is completely irrational. It's completely uh, apathetic to what is necessarily materially good for one oneself. I mean, if you think about the bourgeoisie and, and the effeminate soul, they're okay with, uh, you know, rotting on the vine so to speak so long as they're safe and they're cozy and they have like all the uh, material advantages that modern life uh, provides you just as back then but he was he was not satisfied with that and he wanted to leverage technology and his innovative spirit and his fiery soul towards a new vision of the world almost like the suez he he envisioned himself cutting through uh the uh the geriatrics of back in the day, just like the Suez, and provide a new horizon, a new future. And so I hope that gives a, a really good background as far as where Marinetti comes from, because as we talk about his life and as he goes into the future, I think you have to understand this from his context, how exactly he started you know, his career as a young kid. I mean, I'm sure you guys know a lot of your childhood memories are probably the most strong aside from those that you make at, you know, 18 to 22. But without further ado, I'll hand it back to you if you have any comments or, or uh, thoughts here. Yeah, and it's interesting that you talk about the sort of decadence of that time period. And I think this is in a lot of ways why, though they, in, in many ways, they, they kind of work together a lot, uh, D'Annunzio and um, Marinetti. The reason why there was such heavy disdain towards D'Annunzio from Marinetti is that, there is a overabundance of traditionalism and reactionary sentiment in the right of that time. The right was dominated by reactionary sentiment. And to a large part today, it's still stuck in this paradigm. And Marinetti is one of those few people who does not allude to the classical age for his legitimacy, who does not say we need to return to this golden age. No, he is very much a forward thinker and in a lot of ways, how you can justify him as one of the true heirs of Nietzsche, for instance, is that it is about replacing the past with something more vital and greater. So, of course, he is a student of Sorel. And somebody like Evola, for example, would be very against Sorel as a sort of revolutionary figure. And many other reactionaries at the time would also be against uh, Sorel's philosophy. But Marinetti is very much a revolutionary, but he is a right-wing revolutionary which is quite unique in that time and a lot of the reasons why futurism didn't end up becoming the prominent art form in fascist Italy is because Mussolini was balancing all these different right-wing factions. Many of them were reactionary. So, of course, to appease the reactionaries and traditionalists, you see a lot of the architecture and art in fascist Italy uh, being a sort of return to this classical era, a Greco-Roman style, whereas Marinetti, and sometimes I think Marinetti takes it a little too far with like the futurist cookbook, you know, pasta is pretty good, guys. I don't <laughs> think we need to get rid of pasta. I like pasta. And I don't think we need to get rid of the museums, Marinetti, but, but allegorically and symbolically, I think there is a very good message behind Marinetti saying, we need to destroy the museums. We need to tear down the old statues. Well, I personally wouldn't take that literally. I get what he's saying. You don't want to be confined by the past. You don't want to be restricted by the past. And of course, that's why Marinetti is such a unique figure. He's, he's probably one of the only, really one of the only right-wing figures at the time who has this completely forward-thinking right-wing orientation. It's revolutionary. It's not confined by the past. It's not confined by traditionalism. It's not reactionary. And this is very unique. And of course, this is what you talk about, Lance. And you know, you're, you're, you're making the allusions to Victorian era Egypt, which is of course, you know, Victorian British uh, bourgeois. And even in books like Man and Technics, uh, Spengler talks about the emergence of revolutionary figures uh, both right and left wing, though prominently left wing because Marx ended up uh, sort of defining that era of revolutionary activity. It's a response to this decadence and to this bourgeois nature. It's a response to a neglect for engineering. You talked about Marinetti coming from an engineering family, a technical family. It's, it's uh, the ills of forgetting about technics as an important form of will to power. And People will say, oh, well, it was perfect in the past. Everything was better in the past. Let's be traditional. Let's, let's be reactionary. And of course, I take a lot of inspiration from the past. I enjoy reading Evola. I think there's merit in reading him, but to treat it like dogma, 
I'll ask somebody like a Voler, I'll ask a reactionary, well, if things were so perfect, how did it lead to a decadent aristocracy in France, for example, or a decadent aristocracy in Russia? Ultimately, you can't be confined by the past because the past led us here. So clearly it wasn't perfect. Clearly it wasn't this golden era because if it was subverted, and this is something you get with Christianity a lot, is, um, you know, people say, oh, well, it was perfect back then. You know, Christians during the Crusades fought off the Muslim invaders, whatever. I'm like, okay, sure. But then it also led to the day, right? So you have to look at these these supposedly perfect dogmatic uh, philosophies or religions and well, how did it lead us to this decadent period? There, there's got to be a reason for that, which is why I love Nietzsche and Marinetti so much is because it's this constant revolution of, of something new. Something a friend of mine pointed out about Nietzsche recently is he said the beauty of Nietzsche and philosophy is it's, it's a convergence of all these contradictions that when they bounce against each other, it creates these sparks, which create these, these beautiful things. Uh, so I, I think there's some truth to that. There has to be this constant forward motion, this constant kinetic motion. And something that you talk about, Lance, a lot is like we can't drop pack. Uh, there is no Hegelian end of history where everybody's equal and there's so much justice and so much good, essentially heaven, Precisely. right? Like Hegel, Hegel Kant, Heidegger, they're, they're very much Christian thinkers in a lot of ways, even though they say mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you know, we don't believe in metaphysics the way that the Christians do. They're essentially coming to the same conclusion. So anyway, without further ado. Be careful. You might, you're going to give away their address. <laughs> That's the thing is that. You know, it's it's interesting because so many people, they, I mean, especially Christians have beef with communists because they think, uh, you know, like obviously the communists had ostensible, they were ostensibly at odds with uh, Christians, but they weren't. Uh, the reason why they have such a strong beef with each other is because of the fact that they're basically the same, the exact same thing, but different font, which is to say it's the same reason why Stalin hated Trotsky and vice versa. It's like, it's this interesting rivalry which is it means nothing to people at large but the reason why they have such a strong hatred for each other is because they're essentially the same now um regarding marinetti i, I think you're absolutely right and um i think what people need to understand about the past is the past was lived forward just as we are lived forward now and the innovations which happened in the past you know happened as if they were innovations of our present so what i mean by that is basically you know back in the day there is always some kind of, uh, you know, I guess, conservative or reactionary saying, back in my day, we didn't have Christ. We had blah, blah, blah. We had this or that. And, and like, I get it. Like, uh, to a certain extent, there are some actual tangible differences and some which are simply innovations or um, basically uh, expansions of what it was already. And so what I mean by this is, like, you can parse out the the delineations of history or the innovations of history by sussing out what the the quintessence of that change is, and what do I mean by that? I, I mean like, you know, you you can't judge a a um, philosophical school or a technological school or something like that by mer merely the fact that it's an innovation. You have to think to yourself, is this different in degree or kind, right? So I would argue that Hegelianism is simply a, a difference of degree from Christianity. It's one and the same. It's along the same branch. But in kind, it's not, right? It's one and the same. Now, like going for forward or going back rather, why is Nietzsche so important? And why was Nietzsche so important to us? He's born to Denunzio, who Denunzio introduced to Marinetti. And um, effectively, the reason why he was so important is because he, he took us back to a point in time when there was a true fork in the road philosophically. This is all the way back to Heraclitus, the idea of flux. And, uh, you know, just like, obviously, you know, the warrior philosopher, he, he takes a lot of interest in the past, but not to replicate it superficially. I mean, I have personal interest in the past, but by its essence. And for me, the essence of the past, especially when it comes to Rome, was this aristocratic impulse, the impulse of self-overcoming, of conquest, of um, strength, of vigor, of vitality. And what to me was basically the fall of that classical era, which is Christianity, and then later, of course, communism. And today, which is really communism, different font, but wokeism, right? It's this idea that is, woe is me, everything sucks, I'm a, I'm a loser, 
life life just sucks and uh there's only that right and this is where you know we i i believe take a stand against that feeling that that world feeling of tiredness of uh lethargy of being old of the olds you know old controlled government um and the reason why we're against that is because it, it stifles all vitality and that's precisely what marinetti was getting against right because one of his greatest quotes was that europe and the world had turned into one big museum but it's funny because in italian the word that he used was interchangeable with a mausoleum right and the mausoleum being of course you know a resting place it's death death itself and I think that's what me and uh, Warrior Philosopher are all about, is resurrecting this world from death, from the old, from the boomers, and giving back life to our, our time, infusing that essence from the past, not necessarily what they were as such, but what they represented, this greater meta metaverse, if, if I were to be so anti-Nietzschean in a second, you know, <laughs> the, the, the spirit, you know, of the time. So go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd like to read a quote. Well, not, not just a quote, actually, but the uh, first futurist uh, manifesto, which is very short. And uh, Marinetti says, we futurists whose sole political program is one of national pride, energy, and expansion denounce before the whole country the irrevocable shame which is a possible clerical victory would bring upon us. We futurists call on all talented young people of Italy to engage in a struggle to the bitter end against candidates who have any truck with the traditionalists and the priests. We futurists want a national representation which, freed from mummies and from every sort of pass pacifist cowardice, will be ready to extricate us from any snare and to respond to any offense whatsoever. And this is precisely what we're talking about, is freeing ourselves from the mummies of the past. Ultimately, the shift that Lance is talking about is one of pacifism. It's one of the ends justify the means. What ends, though? What ends? Anyone who preaches and ends and ends where you drop pack, where everything's going to be good afterwards, everything's going to be fine, all you have to do is this, this, and this, and this, and eventually you'll get this, and you won't have to worry afterwards. This is plagued and polluted and infiltrated the psyche of our entire world, really, uh, for most of human history because of that shift that Lance talks about, uh, life in flux versus life, a static life, or a life towards a static end. You see this in media, something I talked about before, I think. In Disney movies, for instance, there's always the happy ending, right? The Prince Charming and the princess meet and they become king and yeah. queen, but they never talk about how five years from then the prince or the now king goes out and he bangs hookers and he does coke. <laughs> and uh, meanwhile, Cinderella is depressed all the time and eventually she starts having an affair with her uh, her servant and then the king finds out and kills the uh, servant and then – so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the point, yeah. Yeah. but you, you know what I'm saying? Like they don't talk. It's always a happily ever after. It's never a acceptance that, like you say, life is constantly in flux. And why would you not want it to be? That's like the beauty of life, and why eternal occurrence as a concept is so valuable and important, and why I reject this Hegelian notion. And like I said, and I always say, there are some aspects of Hegelian thought that uh, I do think have some credence however the overarching essence because we're talking about essence and kind correct so essence i, I get a lot of the right, essence right. or sorry i get yeah i get a lot of the essence um or sorry even the kind i might be mixing it up here the essence of hegelian thought has a lot of it, the overarching theme is is incorrect however there are some kinds that i like i like seeing the state as a sort of spiritual entity for instance but the overarching theme of hegelian thought of kantian thought of even Heideggerian thought is all from an orientation of, of cowardice and pacifism, just as Marinetti is uh, critiquing. It's this idea that uh, somebody can't allow themselves to be this floating object in open space. It, it brings them fear. They need an enclosed space. They need something to be finite. They need something to be certain and concrete because without this concreteness, then they're untethered to anything and they can't stand the fact that they're untethered. But that's the reality of life is, is you have to, you have to accept life as something that you maybe aren't tethered to anything and that you yourself and only through your action and through your will, can you find things to sort of metaphorically tether to? So I think it's interesting. 
And yeah, uh, go ahead. Yeah, like I, I completely agree with you. And I think, um, you know, there's always this weird, like, um, I mean, I guess I'm guilty of this too, right? Because it's just funny. But, you know, don't fall into the uh, I throw up my gang sign, Hegel, you know, I'm gang show <laughs> yeah. or some ridiculous concept. Like, I think if you're truly someone of great power or vigor, you you take what's good and you discard the rest. And if, uh, you know, if you need uh, a, a different uh, justification to arrive at the same conclusion, luckily life is so diverse and multifarious that you can come up with any reason whatsoever. And, and that's incredibly vital. But, you know, I, I think the interesting thing to me and what's always been so invigorating in me is this idea or this vision of the world that Nietzsche provides to us, which is the idea that, you know, to see how the world truly is, is to think of a child on a beach making sandcastles. And, and once he creates the sandcastle, he, he, you know, levels it and then makes a new one, a slightly different or whatever. And some people think that's like entirely demoralizing. And for me, that's incredibly invigorating because think about like, uh, there is no end. There's no end of history. And do you know, like who I hate the most? Who? Francis. Yeah. Oh, here we go I have again. a personal <laughs> vendetta. Yeah. 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 I have a personal vendetta against him because you know how demoralizing it is at 14 to read and, and look for answers to be like, okay, I want to be a prince. Like, you know, back in, Roman Renaissance days, let's say that. And, uh, you know, I'm looking for all the great political philosophers who are going to give me the secret ingredient to get there, mm -hmm. you know, and the roadmap or whatever. And this guy's like, oh, the end of history is nigh. You know, you were born, it's over. There's no, there's nothing greater than liberalism. It's just, you know, corporate skatocracy for 5,000 years, right? Mm -hmm. In the words of BAP, right? <laughs> and that's incredibly demoralizing. But most importantly, it's entirely false. And this guy has been proven false multiple times in geopolitics, which is apparently his wheelhouse. He's terribly a, a terrible yeah. at it for whatever reason. But the greater point that I'm trying to make is Hegel makes the same uh, mistake. Um, and so, so does everyone else. To say nothing, of course, of their like logical misunderstandings of things and whatever and um a willful i guess obfuscation of the truth but the greater point that i'm trying to make is there's something incredibly invigorating about endless struggle endless strife endless self-overcoming endless self reinvention and this is not to say that you can't be of one nature in this life but the ether is an endless you know almost like a rolling ocean a rolling wave of formation and deformation and reformation once again um and and for me for a guy that loves to fight i love the fact that there's always another fight there's always another way to get back at it more energy more strength more beauty always a chance for more 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 and that's incredibly full of life and that's what marinetti and the futurists brought to italy especially out of every other country because remember before I hand it off to you, Italy was probably the quintessential museum of Europe. It was this place that harbored, obviously, the Roman Empire, and then it had Renaissance, you know, and then it obviously was the heart of Christianity for a long time, and still is to a certain extent. But but the the greater feeling that, you know, Italy gives is like all the best days were of yesteryear there are no more greater days it was simply that's it you know we we blew our load we did a roper all over the world and and that's it we, we, that's all we got you know mm -hmm. and uh and for him he's like fuck that no, no no we got way more we have we have the intensity we have the fucking spirit and that's what i enjoy so much about reading about the futurists if you don't mind can you read that part about the futurists where it's like uh we we intend to glory in war and so on and so forth. Yeah, let me see. I have that. Uh, I think there we go. So, to your shame, you have adopted Giolatti's reformist blueprint, the cause of our present decline, that inauspicious, indeed idiotic prescription of a greedy, profiteering peace settlement. We, on the other hand, promote and support the dual preparation for war and revolution under the auspices of a more intense patriotism in the divine name of Italy, blazoned across our skies in the fiery vapors of a revitalized Italian courage. We believe that only an aesthetic of blood and an ethic of danger and heroism can purify and regenerate our nation. Boom, exactly. And I think in a, in a small part, I, th I think that's what you and I 
tend to or or aspire to imbibe here in our modern time and obviously we have a long way and we're just a fledgling you know two dudes on, <laughs> on uh, transmission here together but i think one man is ten thousand if he's best and we are ten thousand right um and i think that's what people who listen to us should at least have that same kind of vigor that same kind of daring um to have the the vision to see something else manifest in this life aside from what has been thus far. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think that when we use the words Faustian, for instance, or we use the word Promethean, you can't call yourself Faustian or call yourself Promethean and then say, well, if only we stuck to this system in the past, if only we went back to this, everything would be better. And this is why Marinetti uh, doesn't like actually to use the Rome uh, allusions. He actually alludes to Italian supremacy instead because of what you're saying, because he felt that so much of Italy was stuck in the past and that their national identity was what had been, right? We're going to be unburdened by what has been, you know, shout out to Kamala. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, unironically, and this is why the left is beating the right currently is because they are adopting this. Now it's a progression downwards, but it's still a progression, right? And that's why uh, right. they have a lot of the youth support. Of course, that's changing because I think as Frog Twitter grows, uh, the young, restless, angry men of the future have this new thing that they can sort of associate with. But but I digress. But when we think of Faustian and Promethean, I think I, when I read Marinetti, I can't help but, but say, well, this is exactly what I would write if I was trying to write as a Promethean or as a Faustian. The words that spills from him. And I'll read a couple of quotes here really quick. Uh, but we artists are not intellectuals of that sort. Above all else, we are fast beating hearts, bundles of electrified nerves, instinctive beings who are ruled only by a divine intoxicating intuition. And we believe ourselves to be, or indeed are, all ablaze with the proverbial sacred flame. I mean, what is more Promethean fire than that? The Provo pro proverbial sacred flame that's literally the promethean fire the promethean torch the torch that allows man the material the flesh through techniques through the technical processes to become the divine essentially and it's so so beautiful how he writes um another one we wish to snatch violently away from the old the dying and the dead all the rights and the authority and instead grant these to the youth and this reminds me a lot of what Nietzsche talks about in Twilight of the Idols and, and saying the deepest philosophy is in your own body. He talks about the Greeks' worship of youth. And it makes me think of Mishima, for instance. Why did Mishima take his life when he did? It was to preserve that fire forever, that Promethean fire. Nothing is infinite in the Hegelian sense or in the Christian sense where there is this end state happily ever after. But some, thing are, can be, some things can be eternalized in single moments. Mishima eternalizes beauty. This is what Bap, Bap has a great quote about this. I can't, I can't quite remember right now, but when Mishima tore his stomach apart with that blade, he immortalized the beauty of, of the physical moment, his physical aesthetic. He, he immortalized that in that moment. There is no happily ever after in the sense where, you know, you're, you're going to meet Prince Charming and have 50 years of happiness, but there are some eternities. There is the eternal fire which lives on and inspires us. It is almost this meta sort of concept. Of course, there are there is a material that that fuels this this meta fire. But it is interesting, and of course, there is there is even faiths around this today with uh, Prometheism with Georgiani, and he calls them Igors or something like that. Agors, uh, like I think yeah, so, like the, yeah, like Prometheus. I think is one of his Agors, and I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. But it's it's like this meta uh, spirit, right? That sort of transcends through the ages and is the fuel to the fire that moves bodies that that it's it's like that kinetic motion or it's that force that pushes something into kinetic motion and and i, I think that's that's exactly the the uh the spirit that the futurists are trying and trying to imbibe and that's why the futurists want to sort of bring art into the into the uh public. They, Marinetti says he wants to turn art, sorry, he wants to turn the government into a selfless art. And this is, I think, why he puts so much stock in war, in militarism. He specifically paints out that anti-militarists are one of his enemies, one of the enemies of futurists. And you think, hmm, an artist who wants a military state. When you think about art, 
with, with both the utility and also the uh, the actual beautification of it, the actual aesthetic, it, it does make a lot of sense to relate war and art because the greatest art throughout history has always had this sort of martial element, the greatest symphonies, the greatest uh, statues, the greatest uh, performances, the Colosseum. There's always this martial element. Uh, and I think that it's lost today because of what you, what you talk about, this sort of stagnant worldview, the end state worldview, the end of history worldview. And we talk about guys like Francis Fukuyama, who completely turned out to be wrong. Of course, you know, the people that thought liberalism would be this this end state perfect ideology. Well, guys like Mearsheimer uh, talk about this, actually, and how it was all based on this completely false pre premise, just as naive as anarchism, just, I, just as naive as non-aggression principle. These things that are unfounded in reality and just make no sense. And that's why word, word selling can only get you so far, because a lot of idealism depends upon the manipulation of language to create these syllogisms that you're like, you're, you're scratching your brain and thinking, well, I guess that makes sense. But in, in a sense, language can be subversive too. Mishima talks about that. Language can be subversive, the corrosive nature of words. So like you, you mentioned, Lance, there's still value in studying Hegel or studying all these people. Right now, I'm going through being and time. And I got to say, it's incredibly difficult, but it's allowed me to think and it allowed me to say, okay, well, what is wrong with the idealist? Why do I disagree with them? Right. And, and of course, there's plenty of, uh, plenty of value within idealism. And uh, even neo Hegelian thinkers like Gentile, I was kind of going through, uh, was it theory of the mind and spirit or something like that? Um, so there is, it's all a very interesting stuff. But I think over the overarching thing behind all those trains of thought says a lot of these guys, these, it's idealism essentially, and theism and idealism is that it's all about tethering themselves. And futurism is all about untethering yourself, not untethering yourself because you want to float off into the abyss, but untethering yourself so you, like a rocket, can be propelled across and anywhere and beyond. That's Faustian, is, is believing you have an endless shot where you're just going to shoot forward, you're going to go as far as you can, expand endlessly. That's the futurist vision and why Marinetti is this Faustian and Promethean thinker. Uh, so... Yeah, I find a lot of yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, it, it's also the idea. It's like swimming, right? You're you're in the water, and though you might not be tethered, you still have uh, the ability to move, and you have an axis on, along which you can move, and you can choose your your fate, right? You can work your way towards something. It's just that for people with small like spirits, small you know everything about them, it, it, this this is like daunting, right? This is uh, terrible, but also it, it's not useful. Um, here's the one utility of Hegelianism, and it's why uh, communism really, I, I guess, in the form of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels through material dialecticism, which is effectively the material version of this, right, uh, seized on the idea is that it provides others with an axis around which to act, right? And what does this mean? It means that, like, you know, you're able to understand, okay, this is Rome, I am acting like in concert with this greater orchestra by going along with the spirit with my own little flair about it right and that's something that really kind of um i guess uh, these uh free spirit type individuals which i will concede uh don't really provide it, it it's it's something that nietzsche himself doesn't provide to uh to his readers he says that you yourself have to come up with your own justification your own reasoning in life and uh that's incredibly daunting for a lot of people right i mean it's it's something that's just uh difficult and, and for myself it's it's one of those things that's difficult for me because i you have to be a multitude you have to be just like a a galaxy brain individual to be able to actually sustain yourself in, with that kind of flux and there's nothing wrong with admitting that. It's just about necessarily harnessing that spirit or those people who might not be ubermensch themselves, but constitute around a central principle, mm -hmm. a central idea. And this is what Hegel provides and uh, people such as Giovanni Gentile try to address, right, in their own specific cause and, and reason. And for Giovanni Gentile, the idea of um, uh, active, active idealism, which is the idea that you basically... You, you have to not simply think, but act on your thoughts to be able to constitute the ideas that you want out in the world, because there are always others who are trying to constitute their ideas and therefore abrogate 
your ideas from being manifest. I know there's a lot of word cell junk, but the idea is that you have to get after it. Otherwise, the enemy is going to win, right? That's just basically the idea. You have to go and see the forms out in the, in the world. Otherwise, you won't be able to sustain your own. Now, um, I, I guess, you know, in, in the form of bringing it back to Marinetti, why I love Marinetti the most and why it's so important is he's one of those guys that brought back the idea that politics and uh, philosophy and history, all of this, all the things that we think is stuffy and intellectual or is actually supposed to be artistic. And art, it has to be something that is comes from a font of spirit that's irrational. No rationalism. It has to be no rational um, you know, anchoring. It has to actively affirm the principle that we choose to make beautiful that which best suits us or, or uh, grants our spirit, makes it more full. And I, I think the, the greater point that I'm trying to make here is that basically that like, you know, all the ideas, for instance, uh, the, the, the futurist, um, you know, our DT salute, let's say the Roman salute, that was a, a, a manufacturer or rather a, 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 an initiative taken by Nuncio um, to bring back artistry to, to politics to make politics grand theater and it's so important and you see this why who 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 wins nowadays are those that are able to make a grand theater out of their politics and the greatest calamity that's uh, basically befallen humanity since 1945 is this shrinking back from theater of politics and so you get either dour soviet type tier you know, um, I don't even know what you would call it, the Soviets isms, where it's like a bunch of boring old men in boring old suits talking about boring old things. Or it's in the West, same thing, boring old men in boring old suits talking about boring old stuff, saying how we must be in substance so different from the Soviets when we're not. And uh, it, it's really funny to me because it's like it's something that uh, is a recurring theme. And it's why we have so much potential. And it's why the enemies of the future are usually so inimical to us, because really we have this font of vitalism and energy that we can bring back into the into the fore and remind people what they were born for. They were born for beautiful horizons, and it is us that will give it to them. You know? Yeah, exactly. And ultimately, what sort of is the central, almost unifying fabric behind all these things which are similar in, or which are essentially the same in essence but different in kind, whether that is Hegelianism, Kantian uh, thought, uh, theism in general across the board, or liberalism, is that all these different uh, philosophies need to tether, like, it goes back to the tethering, but it's essentially a cope for, for uh, it, it's, a limit, it's a limiting cope in the sense that I think they all, all, what all of them need is for something to anchor themselves to in the past. So, for example, uh, for for the Platonists, they have their world of forms. For for the liberals, it's literally a manipulation of materialism. For the Marxists, it's the same thing. Mark Marxism is essentially materialist Christianity. You know, uh, right? No, exactly. Seriously. Yeah. Unironically, yes. <laughs> so that's their that's their tether. That's their anchor. That's their god. Their god is economics, strangely enough. And Avola talks about this. Of course, Avola uses this to come to the wrong conclusions, but he's right in this in this uh, critique of liberalism and communism is essential. Two sides of the same coin. What we have that they don't have, or rather, what we don't have that they have, is we don't need an anchor in the past to justify what we want in the future. I think our God can be the future. And I don't see why you wouldn't want that to be the case. Our God is the future that we can create and, and will into existence. So for example, let's say you want to bring back airships, <laughs> but not just airships in the past like the Hindenburg, but you want to bring back these these super fast but super big blimps and you want to see them going under <laughs> skyscrapers that look like something out of Star Wars like Coruscant. You can have this almost impossible image. Like for me, one of my, if I were to create a capital city, I would create a tower twice the size of Abu of the uh, Burj Al Khalif in Abu Dhabi, maybe even taller. I would have, I would nice. have these huge statues, maybe of Prometheus. You know, we can work with Giorgiani on that. Shout out to Giorgiani, <laughs> I got you. Um, maybe we'll have a statue of Prometheus or Nietzsche. I think you know. What? 
let's make it Nietzsche. Let's make it Nietzsche. We're going to create a, a, a huge statue of Nietzsche, 10 times the size of the Statue of Liberty. You're going to have these crazy goals. Like we're going to turn Mars into this uh, Sardukar prison planet where it's literally dedicated to creating these psionic super soldiers. Our God is the future that we can create. Our God is this image that maybe we don't quite have all the colors and all the shapes and all the forms picked out, but we have this, this greater goal. There's something called four-dimensional thinking. And some people claim that if you train yourself, you can actually think in four dimensions. So there's this thing called a tesseract. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Lance, but um, it's essentially like a, uh, imagine two cubes and there's a smaller cube inside this, this bigger cube. And each of the corners of the smaller cube connect to the inner corners of the bigger cube. This is a four-dimensional shape that can change forms. Um, if you, you could look up a GIF, of, a GIF or whatever of it, and essentially the little part of the square can come out of the big part of the, or sorry, cube. The, the small cube can come out of the big cube, and they can switch places, and it doesn't really make sense. And uh, one thing I'm practicing right now is I'm constantly looking at this GIF, GIF in slow motion, so I can imagine that in my head. But this is like a concept big. that is very difficult. I can't quite think about what the hell it is, but I'm training myself to think of it. And I think that what we want, you and I, is to create a future where people will be able to think four-dimensionally, where, where we want to be like Nietzsche in the sense where it's Zarathustra. He says, man is but a bridge. Uh, ape is to man what man will be to the ubermensch. I want my great-grandchildren to be stronger and smarter and, and more more advanced than I am. I don't want to just be a human forever. That's the issue, I think, with Heideggerian thought and his concept of Dasein. It's so limited within human, a human. Because if you can't, if you can't accept the utility of consciousness developing over time and even being to some extent present in like an orangutan, if you can't think that we were lesser before, then you're also negating the possibility of us being more in the future. And that more in the future is, I think, the foundational uh, philosophical will of Nietzsche, of Marinetti, of us. So why can't our God be what we can create, what we can will to existence? That's my God to me. Uh, that is my God. And maybe I can't think four-dimensionally today. I'm still working on trying to imagine the Tesseract in my brain. But just because I can't today doesn't mean I can't in 10 years. And just because I might never do it in my life doesn't mean that my blood can't one day do it. It doesn't mean that humanity can't one day do it. We're not limited by the fact that we need to know exactly how things are. We don't exactly know what the future is going to hold, but we have this feeling, this, this fire, this will of what we want to create, this general image. So what we worship is what our potentiality. We worship what we can create in the future. And I think that's what separates us from these other philosophies or theism in general. Right. And I think that's very powerful. And I think that the reason why there are so few that think this way is because most people are coping. They're coping and, and they're coping out of fear and out of cowardice and out of this fear of the abyss, this fear of the unknown. But it is only by thrusting yourself into the unknown and bringing light to the darkness that you're ever actually going to discuss. It's, it's sort of you know, as much as I don't subscribe to platonic thought, you think of Plato's cave allegory. In a sense, it's not correct exactly, uh, not, not his specific allegory of the cave, but you could, you could think of somebody trapped in a cave. And if you're afraid to get out of the cave, that's sort of, in a sense, theism or, or these humanistic uh, philosophies where you're, you're, you're a unique little thing because you are a human and therefore... There's nothing beyond human. Heidegger was afraid of technology because he believed that it would change the Dasein. It would change the being of the human. But I say, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with us becoming more? Maybe we won't be the same, but that's okay. Uh, that was a little rant, but I think you get what I'm saying. I think the interesting thing is that even if we change, I mean, who who cares about it? Evolving is okay. Like, that's the thing. It would still be true to the essence of who we are, Right. Um, and everything that has like, I guess, manifested into what we are today is roughly the way I would describe it is, is a yearning for the infinite. It's for more, it's for 
for a uh, mastery of everything and everyone within like domination of the universe as we conceive of it. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. And that necessarily means a change in forms. Now, what does this, how does this differ from, um, you know, from modern leftist thought, right? Because a lot of you, I can already imagine the uh, chorus of the consecration saying, oh, you, you know, you're just a troon. That's all you are. Like, no, no, no. Like you misunderstand me. The difference between us and and what you call the left is effectively this uh, the vitalism it's an aristocracy of vision right so for for the leftists it's about you know infinite weakness for infinite amount of time forever you know and for us it's about strength and for transmuting ourselves by will into something that is far stronger than us that that exceeds us that that obviously is ergonomic to um to true nature itself right and the ergonomic uh, quality that I'm trying to talk about is that basically the left wants to completely like destroy nature. We don't want to destroy nature. We want to be in tandem with nature towards a greater whole. And those are two very different things, right? Like we still are in tandem and devotees of, of natural strength, but also evolving into something greater just as for instance we all started off as bacteria you know hundreds or millions of years ago and slowly but surely became this great complex and important being that's going to change the the face of this universe ultimately that's the truth that's that's the uh, secret truth that every leftist wants to take away from you is the fact that maybe just maybe you were born to be a god, and they want to take everything away from you, so that way you don't have to be that one. So you just are a loser or a slave forever. And uh, I think that's the difference between us and them, and it's why Marinetti and Denunzio are so great, is because it's this truly piercing uh, will to the unknown, to greater, to more, even if it means risk, even if it means danger and um a lack of becoming, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe you know, on a throw of the dice, we lose everything. But so be it. So be it. So be it if we lose everything, because at least we dared and lived for one day. It's better to live a day as a lion than a hundred years as a goat. And that's what they want to take away from you. They want you to be weak and weak-willed, and they want you to be scared all the time scared of losing but and, and so that way you're a ship in harbor for the rest of your life and yes you may be safe in harbor for a very long time but remember my friend ships aren't meant to be lived in a harbor so they're meant to go out there and to dare great darings and and you know face the storms of reality and so be it if we uh, we uh you know are, are crashed out at sea and we sink so be it. So so let us be, let's make the earth our mausoleum. Let's make it a, a testament to our will and our daring. Um, and the, the funny thing is, though, I don't think it'll ever come to that because at the end of the day, I believe that we'll win. And it's just a matter of, of uh, having the, uh, the, the fortitude to see it through. I mean, that's just really kind of what the, my take in it personally is. Yeah. And like you say, the difference between us is, we're both, I guess the, uh, a lot of the, the sort of essence is acceleration towards a future, but their acceleration is towards death. It's a literal death cult. And you see this in the West today. Well, the West has the lowest birth rates. Countries that are more liberal have the lowest birth rates. Why? Because they create an environment where people don't want to have kids anymore. And when you don't want to have kids, well, what happens? You disappear. It's literal death cult because it becomes, you know, as much as I don't like the whole stoic bro, take cold showers, you know, don't enjoy yourself, don't drink, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. As much as I, you know, that's that's lame. I mean, there, even it's a guy like Nietzsche, people be like, oh, Nietzsche's Dionysian bro, bro, you know, he wants you to do drugs and party. Well, no, you're misunderstanding Nietzsche. That's part of it. But it doesn't mean that you become a slave to these things. It doesn't mean you become a slave to pleasure or consumption. That's essentially Nietzsche's last man, of course. And that's that's what you have throughout the West is you have these people. And this, these people within this liberal system are thrust towards death because they try to satisfy themselves through the material. You know, it's funny. It's funny that you say that because people don't know. They call this hedonistic, right? Yeah. 
But they don't know the actual Greek hedonists believed this very different thing, which is basically it's, you know, for instance, he was talking to this young protege of his. It's like it's one thing to go into a whorehouse. It's quite another if you're not able to come out. So, you know, a hedonist that's a junkie, that's a it's a slave to passion. That is a slave. Yeah. That's that is abominable even to a hedonist. But a hedonist, the the strength of a hedonist is having that discipline to be able to embrace the Dionysian and then of course revert back to a baseline of Apollonian, right? So to be able it, it's like just like your bone, right? So your natural body has these two impulses. It has uh, for instance uh, within your bone, it has um, myocytes and uh, something else. But basically, one creates calcium fiber and the other one deteriorates and destroys. So that way it can recreate new calcium fiber to make it strong just as it was before. The reason why we have, you know, as we age uh, weaker bones is because the myocytes and uh, osteocytes. There we go. That's what it is. My bio, uh, you know, 103 is coming back. But True. the point being is the reason why we have this balance is so that way we're able to actually have strong, a strong form, a strong body. And so you're not able to be one without the other. Um, and so if you're not able to engage in the Dionysian without falling victim to it, or if you completely um, throw away the Dionysian, which is what I think Stoics and Christians try to do, which is cut off half your mm -hmm. face, they're it's funny that they're surprised that they lose and they lose because they become sclerotic old souls. And so the, the secret is to do what the futurist did, which is snore cocaine, <laughs> go yeah. really fast, fight really hard, bang a lot of salutes, and then also still come back to the Apollonian, which is the affirmation of the Italian soul for them, the affirmation of discipline and uh, responsibility of soldierly, uh, you know, basically stoicism, if that makes sense, in, in the, the trial of combat, of vitalism. There are those two playing dynamics, and you can't have a vitalistic whole without both. Yeah. And that's the secret, is that the left is just Dionysian, and uh, the right is just Apollonian, mm -hmm. and we are the secret third thing, right? The secret self-overcoming. Yeah, and I think what I'll kind of finish off with is a little analogy with uh, uh, drugs. There's uh, there's memes of an alcoholic society versus a weed society, but I'm going to switch it up a little bit. And let's think of... Uh, a society of people who take cocaine, okay? Uppers versus downers, cocaine versus <laughs> weed. People people that smoke weed all day, they're clerks, they're cashiers, they're flip burgers, they put your fries in the bag. Now, who does cocaine? They're physicists. They're, they work in corporate finance. They're politicians. You know, they're Wehrmacht soldiers, you know, strung out on meth, about to go gun down 20... Ivans in uh, the middle of winter. They are they are doers. They are strivers. They are Faustian. <laughs> so I, I'm kidding, of course. But the analogy to be made is: think of us like cocaine, and think of them as we. They want you to be all peaceful and relaxed and and calm and and subservient. We want you to be so full of blood that the only way to satisfy this pounding in your heart is to do something, is to move, is to expand, is to do more. Uh, something I always tell people is, or I'll ask you, Lance, have you ever seen a homeless coke addict? No, exactly. I haven't, actually. Case closed. <laughs> <laughs> so be cocaine, my friends. No, but I'm just kidding, of course. You know, don't do drugs, kids. Stay in school. Uh, mind your P's and Q's. No, but, um, but yeah. what I'm trying to say is we don't want you to be comfortable comfortable. We want you to enjoy ecstasy and we want you to enjoy the highest pleasures, but you do so knowing that tomorrow you're going to get after it again and you're going to go through a trial, a crucible of pain and fire. But after that crucible of pain and fire, you're going to go and you're going to, you're going to uh, have the most wonderful pleasure and the most wonderful ecstasy. What we want is to create a real life Valhalla in a sense. You will go out during the day and fight this great battle with the gods Think of that as doing what needs to be done, doing the technical processes, creating those spaceships, creating the, the weapons of war. And then think of uh, the feast at the end of the night as the, the Dionysian. Honestly, Valhalla is a great, uh, a great representation of balancing the Dionysian and the Apollonian. The Apollonian is going out and fighting and doing what needs to be done. And the Dionysian is this big feast you have afterwards. That's the vision I am promoting to you. And through that vision we will be able to create the gods of the future. And that's what I'll end off with. That's right. That's right.
Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think uh, just to make sure that we kind of recenter here on why Marinetti is so important is just that he was a breath of fresh air or rather something more than that. He was actually a flame in a time when it was all sclerotic that the end of history kind of for them had been written out, that it was effectively going to be this boring, slow march to, you know, industrial society. And that was it. Well, that was a lie. And it was because of his great vision that he transmuted into this world and saw the world as this artistic being coming into life that was written by our hand that, you know, great new horizons were revealed to us humans, to us men who aspire to be more. So if anything, read Marinetti, read his words, read the Futurist Manifesto, it, you know, really take it in and make it part of yourself. And I promise you, you'll see the same horizon today with a new luster and a new flame um, and, and maybe a new vision of how you seek technology as a boon as opposed to a, a bane of humanity. So thank you. I appreciate you having me on, brother. I thank you so much. Of course, much. and uh, stay tuned, everyone, because this is not the last you shall see of us. Even if we should die tomorrow or one of us should fall, our spirits will live on, and you will see us in an eternal recurrence of reincarnations and new spirits, new pieces of energy in different forms until we win. So that is what I will uh, leave you off with, Legionaries. But thank you for listening. As you can tell, I'm a little sick, so... Uh, but it matters not. We have to go forward no matter what. As Marinetti would have wanted, Bruh. embrace speed. Embrace speed. Do speed. Take speed. Just kidding. Uh, but anyway, as always, this is the Warrior Philosopher building the foundations of the Warrior Philosophy. And we'll see you next time.